All right, welcome everybody to this week's K-12 Politics and Tech Update. I'm Tim Watrous, President of Digital Advisors, joined by Kevin Gordon, President of Capital Advisors. Kevin, great to be here with you again this week. Yep, it's good to be back. Well, uh, again, there's no shortage of news these days and uh, lots, of, lots of stuff happening in Sacramento. Can you fill us in on, uh, on, on the latest up, uh, up in the state capitol? Yeah, well, there's, it was a very busy week. You know, the big headlines were around the governors saying, sort of thinking out loud about schools coming back in July. I'm going to get to that a little bit later, but I'm going to start with uh, talking a little bit about the most current thing that happens today, we're expecting it at least today, which is the Department of Education will be posting the, uh, the form that you'll need or the outline that you'll need for the COVID-19 operations report. This is the report that's sort of going to be used for July 1 uh, in lieu of you doing an LCAP in July, and then the LCAP will move to December 15th. The legislature is going to be involved with that, and we're going to get a lot more guidance and a template on that later. But for the time being, the thing to focus on is this COVID-19 operations report. It was said when they announced it, when it was first talked about by the governor, to be something that you could do in a couple of pages. I mean, we've heard that kind of thing before when we first started the LCAP process. It ended up becoming this incredibly bureaucratic process and a very big document. So we're hoping that that the spirit of keeping this thing brief, focusing on the things that you guys have done relative to COVID-19 in particular and their key target areas, and you'll see more about that on the CDE website, hopefully today. So that's kind of the lead issue. I know, um, Tim, you and I were talking a little bit earlier about just in very surprising development from the college board relative to a major district down in San Bernardino County. Fill us in a little bit on that. Yeah, uh, we're going to do a little bit more investigating on this, Kevin, just to, in all fairness. But uh, there's a large school district in San Bernardino, as you mentioned, that has been informed that uh, about 1,200 of their students that have uh, PCs are not going to be able to take the language portion of the college entrance exam. And, you know, I believe the college board has done a lot of great things to allow students to be able to take these exams from any device anywhere, but there's some technical uh, difficulties in allowing students to take this uh, critical test on a PC. And it actually kind of doesn't matter which platform isn't supported. The fact that there's 1,200 students in one district in Southern California, if you sort of multiply that across the country, we're probably talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of students that are going to have sort of like this missing aspect of their requirements that they would hope to would move them to the colleges they might want to go to. So let me just say that uh, that I I believe that there's not necessarily a technical solution that can be uh, deployed before May 26th, which is when all these tests have to come back. I don't believe there's a technical solution because you'd have to get something out to everyone that, that everyone could push out to all their remote devices in a very short period of time. Uh, I believe this is more of a let's give school districts more time to get this done and students more time to get this done and maybe a little bit of grace from the higher ed institutions that look at this to understand that there is a technical problem. I will also say that uh, I would also urge companies like College Board, folks like Microsoft to, to get together and work on this and you know try to give some sort of relief to districts that are really struggling just trying to get devices and connectivity to students. Um, you know, and, and this is something that's sort of like a little bit further down the priority list, but it's still a very important thing. And, and it is a big time equity issue. So we're gonna do a little bit more investigation on this and right. we're gonna get you some more info. But for now, it's something that you should definitely be concerned about. And I would say make a little bit of noise about so that we get the grace we need on that extended timeline. So in essence, they're kind of dictating what devices are acceptable and what's not. I mean, a district that's made a big investment in certain PCs or whatever like that now is finding that that they're basically thumbing their nose at it for probably some technical reason and they're saying what chromebooks are the only way or what what are they saying right now the way it sounds is this can be administered on chromebooks uh this test can be administered on chromebooks and not pcs and it, and it doesn't matter if that were flipped it would still be a tough issue for schools to deal with right now and uh -huh. i will just say Everyone has had to make big time exceptions and changes in the way we do business, including us, Kevin, doing, doing things like this. Um, yeah. 
there's, you know, I, I believe something that has this potentially big of an impact on that many students, we really need to, uh, we really need to extend that time frame. Otherwise, I don't see a way that you're going to be able to have a fair um, shot for all kids to take that test and get to the colleges they want to go to this year. Uh, yep. We'll, get, we'll keep working on that issue. So one, one thing, Kevin, I know uh, you kind of alluded to it before, but we've been getting some mixed messages from Sacramento. I've been kind of scratching my head a little bit here and there. And uh, one of those uh, like legislative budget hearings is one. Would you mind starting us off with that? Yeah, the, 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 but we did have some hearings this week, legislative budget committee and a subcommittee hearing, and there were mixed messages. What we got is a lot of concern about, um, about the budget, the overall numbers, and in fact, we also heard from Pace this week where people started ringing the alarm bells about what they thought the potential cuts could be that are coming. The fact of the matter is, is Department of Finance has been rather conservative about what they've said because we just don't know yet. So when you take these guesses that people are making, um, I think there's just a lot of room for incredible panic. Um, we know that there's a legislative and a political process ahead of us. And if we do our jobs and we articulate what the consequences could be of really deep cuts in education, that will be an effective way to communicate our message. So that lawmakers who have a disposition to wanting to make sure that, that schools are going to be okay for kids um, need to know what the consequences of budget cuts might look like. And so there's no doubt that cuts are coming and that all school districts need to prepare for that possibility. But the depth of, of the cuts is still unknown. And, and, and we know that it, it is a very, very deep fiscal circumstance that the state has. But there are also a lot of things that we don't know when people throw out numbers, uh, guesses about per pupil cuts. They're not taking into, a, into account a whole lot of different political and fiscal variables. So we need to sort of wait a little bit on that. At the same time, we had a lot of legislators, not just legislators, but then the governor, talking about a lot of different initiatives and things that ought to be done that actually cost more money. And so we're hearing about budget problems, but then we're hearing about things that there's an expectation that we might do that cost more money. And of course, leading that side of the conversation was the governor this week, when, again, as I put it, he was sort of thinking out loud, talking about potentially bringing schools back in July. And I think really what he meant was that to the extent that it's feasible and, and out of a concern for learning loss, if there is a capacity for school districts to contemplate the idea of coming back early, it would be a good thing and we ought to look at it. But it's not the way it came out when he announced it and it conveyed to parents and communities that the governor was going to ask all schools to open in July and it created an expectation that our school districts are left kind of holding the bag on. And then if you as a school district know that it's not practical and not doable, you end up looking like you're the outlier to your community and that you're not leading somehow. And I think the administration just doesn't understand that when they say those kinds of things, the burden that it puts on local school districts. So we really do need to try to build a little bit more sensitivity into some of the messaging that comes out of Sacramento. We clearly see that the governor's heart is in the right place. There are tough issues that we have to grapple with, but it's going to be a really steep climb to get reopened on the normal track. I think the other thing that the administration, in this case the governor, didn't realize when he said we might have to open early in July or August, that um, um, overall in the majority of school districts actually open in August. That is a normal time that we open. So it isn't early, and we've got a lot of work to do, even by the governor's own metrics that he put out the week before last and this week. He had his six points uh, criteria that would be measured for purposes of reopening. And this week he had another scale of key things, key conditions that all have to be met in four different, across four different sort of stages and putting us in stage two. But the prerequisites for that are significant. Like, for example, you know, comprehensive availability of testing across the state it would have to happen before we could reopen schools. And there are other kinds of capacity issues that are there. So I think we're a little longer off than, than he might want to be the case. But in the meantime, 
the superintendent who you know ends up getting involved after the governor you know makes remarks like this to engage schools and get information back and try to deploy some information so that we can make educated decisions about when is the right time that work is underway by the state superintendent and and he's juggling a lot of different issues simultaneously this is one of them and there was a a big call this week on that there are subcommittees that are created to look at every aspect of reopening there are really big implications like the idea of opening early you know didn't understand the fact that we do have this thing called collective bargaining and we do have a whole lot of other issues that we have to look at that weigh on that um, a number of faculty who will say are we have a mature faculty in california there are a number of them who would be presumably those that should be staying at home you know how do you deal with the personnel issues the collective bargaining issues and a lot of the other issues did you seriously thinking about opening early so a lot of that was raised this week. You need to know that it's the beginning of the conversation, certainly not the end. I think it's not going to be practical for the overwhelming majority of school districts to do something like reopening in July. But there are important points to consider that Linda Darling Hammond and others mentioned about when we do go back, taking into consideration the fact that school was really closed pretty abruptly and how do we make that transition in a way that makes sense from an educational standpoint. So, those are the kind of mixed things we got. We got major budget problems, but people have ideas on how to spend more money, obviously in conflict with each other, but that's going to get sorted out as the weeks uh, press ahead. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about special ed. This week also we had the announcement by the U.S. Secretary of Education that was really disappointing. Um, as many of you know, we had, a, we had a conference call with the Assistant Secretary of Education for special ed. Um, and Mark Schultz and talked about a lot of the imperatives for doing some waivers, particularly on due process, on IEP timelines, on the state monitoring, on the 15% uh, disproportionality, significant disproportionality set aside. A lot of these things we need relief on. And the secretary concluded that she wasn't going to recommend to Congress any waivers across these critical areas. So that really puts school districts in a difficult position, and it's going to be a challenge moving forward. Uh, and the least of which, which we've raised this uh, this week to folks, are the, the specter of just lots of legal fees and litigation and some of those kinds of things that may come about as a result of not getting any relief on special ed. So that effort continues. Um, we're communicating with members of the California delegation so that they know our sentiment about special ed issues. So even though the secretary has chosen not to move on this, it doesn't mean that we are going to back off of putting pressure on the system to look at the implications of some of these issues. The final issue that I had, Tim, was around um, the part of the CARES Act. Remember, it was in two pieces. One was a $1.6 billion allocation in California that will go out based on Title I distribution. But the other was one that was put in the discretion of the governor. The governor's part of the CARES Act funding, the stimulus package is $355 million that you know he, he gets to direct. We've corresponded with the administration about the fact that we would love that money to go out as evenly as possible across school districts across the state. Um, what the governor announced yesterday was that his intention is to announce what his plans are with that money at the May revision. So that does a couple of things. Number one, it delays how quick we're going to see that money. But at the same time, he's he's probably doesn't have a lot of latitude on that because it is going to take an act of the legislature to approve that appropriation and get that out the door. So he'll be engaging the legislature a little bit in that process. So we're probably not going to see that component of the stimulus funding delivered to school districts uh, probably before, I would suspect, July or later. Um, but we'll see when that when that happens and how this unfolds. But I did want to mention that that's not a chunk of money that's going out the door right away. The $1.6 billion, however, can in fact move and be distributed uh, before uh, the, the May revision and the full budget process. So that's kind of what I have, Tim. And I know that you had something that you want to raise with regard to some of our conversations with the FCC, many of you know we did 
have a nice almost hour-long conversation with the chairman of the FCC, Ajit Pai, like just a couple of weeks ago, and we were really trying to persuade him to do more uh, relative to funding. What we were really hoping for was a separate set of dollars that would help us on the distance learning piece. But Tim, why don't you talk a little bit about from, from your perspective? Yeah, last week, the FCC announced an initiative to close the digital divide, basically $9 billion initiative, which is a hefty amount of dollars to throw at this problem. The, the thing that sort of strikes me, though, is it's $9 billion is geared at building out a national 5G network to reach people in rural, rural areas and also to have more connectivity you know, across a 5G network. That is awesome. I love the I love the fact that we're going to build out 5G and our nation is going to lead 5G. But basically, in my opinion, we're building out a highway for um, our our uh, you know service providers like the Verizon's and T-Mobiles of the world to be able to uh, you know provide services to folks in these rural areas and provide you know higher internet connectivity. And then what we're doing is we're we're urging those companies to offer discounted rates to the families with school children and uh, families who uh, you know may be economically disadvantaged. So you know when when I hear that nine billion spend, that's like great. And I hear the words closing the digital divide. I also love that. But when I see the plan, it doesn't seem like there's going to be a lot of immediate support that school districts need to get uh, kids connectivity and devices that they need to actually just be in school and learn. Uh, so I guess where I stand as, as a consumer and someone who's just thinking about how our tax dollars are spent nationally, I would really urge everyone to ask for numbers that are more uh, transparent and easier for everyone to understand. And when I say, when, when we hear a big number like $9 billion, let's just say right now we can put a number on getting every student connectivity. Uh, and that might be $5 per student per year. So, you know, if we're going to invest $9 billion, does that bring down that connectivity per student per year from five to three? You know, what is that, what is that net out for me as, as a citizen? Because, you know, as a technology person and someone who actually understands how policy and some of the background stuff works, I'm having a hard time seeing how that $9 billion directly impacts connectivity for our kids. And I will really urge everyone to ask these questions so that we have some transparency and we have some some knowledge about what that investment means to us long term. I'll yeah. also just sort of ask the question, is there, you know, what are the other mechanisms that the FCC can pull right now or leverage right now to help schools right now with these connectivity issues? Because when you say we're going to build out a 5G network with $9 billion, that's not going to happen overnight. It's probably going to take months and years to, to see the effects of that. So, you know, one lever, if you're, if you're uh, not familiar, is called E-rate. Every one of our cell phone bills, there's a small bit that goes to a national fund to get connectivity to school buildings. That needs to be overhauled right away because we are not in school buildings anymore and we're trying to get connectivity to kids. I would urge everyone to push for some sort of massive, uh, you know, some sort of sweeping reform where, you know, we can leverage those dollars that are, that are earmarked to improve connectivity in a building so that we can uh, start to address some of these issues that we have where everyone's actually not in buildings and we don't see that changing for the next year or so. Um, so, you know, just a, just a couple of thoughts as you're reading these news stories, things that you can do to try to help and advocate for what we need. I would definitely urge for, again, transparency in what that $9 billion investment is going to mean to us on the other side. And then yeah. also, what are the things that we can do right now to get districts help right now with these uh, connectivity issues? So really, that, that couple of things that I, I wanted to bring up, Kevin, and, and I want to say thank you for uh, for taking this this uh, the time to, to give these video updates. Um, and any any thoughts there you wanted to add in, Kevin, or, or closing yeah, thoughts? Just like say, I mean, it looks like more of a gift to the big providers like Verizon and the big companies than it is to us actually getting something going more immediately. For schools. The other thing I wanted to mention was that when we'd had the conversation with the chairman of the FCC, we got the impression that he supported, as we do, broadening and changing the rates, uh, the, the rules on E-rate, so that we could reach kids where they are at home. And he came out with a position this week that really countered what we thought we heard on our call, which is it seemed like he was doubling down on the idea that E-rate was not going to be broadened, it was always going to be just school-based which doesn't help us right now. Um, so that was one issue. The second one is 
that there were other funds that we were looking for to help us with connectivity. And, um, and then he did this joint announcement with the Secretary DeVos about saying that $1.6 billion you're getting, which school districts are going to use for a variety of different things, that like that was the fund, like take it out of that money instead of what we thought they were headed toward, which supporting efforts by Congress and another stimulus to do something discreetly about distance learning. So a couple of disappointments on that this week. And again, we'll keep working on it. So, and Kevin, I do want to, uh, I do want to just have add an important note there that the dollars that they said, you know, you can repurpose these dollars for this per, you know, for this new purpose for connectivity. Um, you're, you're taking from something that your district was doing and needed to do critical stuff. And one, actually the bucket, one of the things that that bucket was intended for was providing services to homeless children. So, I mean, and, and there's other purposes for those dollars. But to say, okay, yeah, you can use those dollars for other things. What are you going to stop doing that you're going to repurpose those dollars for? That puts districts in a really tricky spot. Uh, and I do want to be fair to say that the FCC did make a change or a couple of changes to E-rate that were, uh, let's just say, helpful, but, uh, but not necessarily the sweeping changes that we need to see. And one was sort of um, giving the ability for companies to be able to provide things for free to districts as they need them. Um, where in the past that would have been a violation of E-rate and you would, uh, necessarily, you, you would have um, maybe not been eligible for your dollars or been called out in an audit for, uh, for not using E-rate properly. So they did make some efforts to, to create some relief, but again, I'll just say not necessarily what we need to see for schools to really be able to tackle this challenge that they're facing right now. Um, so my final thing that I want to wrap up with is just to say, we want to make this easier for folks to consume, which is why we've uh, basically built a YouTube page. So you can basically go to YouTube, subscribe to this page and click the little bell and you'll get notified every time we put up a new video. You'll also get the emails uh, from the Capital Advisors team, you know, with, with the, these updates. But I just wanted to, to let you know, please go to our YouTube page and subscribe. Every time we uh, produce a new video, you'll be automatically notified. And I uh, want to thank you all for, for jumping on and checking out this week's edition of the Politics and Tech Update. Thanks, Kevin. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tim. All right. Take care.